Majar, is it? Welcome. Um, so why native plants? Um, native plants were here before we were, and the insects that, and bird life and everything else were here before we were. We, what we've done when we've come to an area is generally look to the, the space and see all those beautiful plants from, from everywhere else in the world where we might have come from and want to bring those here as well. So these introduced species, um, people like in their gardens because they don't have holes in the leaves. They don't, they don't supply anything really for or very much for the native fauna uh, that's here. So butterflies, caterpillars, um, particularly I was asked you know, garden groups who likes butterflies and everybody puts up their hands and then you know, who likes caterpillars nobody puts up their hands or maybe few and then I just say you can't have one without the other <laughs> um, it, if you don't like what was the thing that they don't like caterpillars oh caterpillars yeah yeah larvae they, they don't like larvae you know, caterpillars eating the leaves of their uh, their plants and and so uh, but if you don't if you don't like the caterpillar, you don't like the butterfly or the moth or whatever. So uh, one of the things about natives is they will have holes in their leaves because they're actually supplying food for, for the native fauna that, that lives here. Um, and so that's one of the things you have to live with. You know, you expect to have caterpillars uh, e eating the leaves. And then if you've got caterpillars, the who who knows why why caterpillars are important to um, birds? Well, let me give you a. They eat them, me, right? Yeah. Let me give you they. Well, caterpillars uh, aren't really the food for adult birds, but they're the food for young birds, for chicks. No. The chicks can't eat seeds; they eat soft food, just like young kids, I guess, eat soft food before they get onto to more adult food. Um, so they can't chew. They actually, you know, and the 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 crop isn't isn't strong enough. So basically, they um, they eat caterpillars. And if you haven't got native plants that are producing native caterpillars, and uh, you don't have native birds, and so you you know the whole life cycle starts to fall to pieces when it, um, when you don't do that. So. Um, so this, it's, it's, it's native plants are, are really critical to to having native fauna. Um, bees, uh, our bees are in decline for exactly the same reason. The bees are not being attracted to to uh, the, the introduced species because they didn't they didn't evolve with them. And so uh, where where we have an invasive species, generally it's we've we've got a generalist insect that's actually um living and moving those species around or, it's, or maybe they're producing red fruits and and every bird will eat a red fruit it's just like every butterfly um will, will drink the 20 percent uh, sugar water that's in a flower the nectar so the butterflies usually don't care um what, what they use for for um for powering their flight but but the uh the caterpillar of the butterfly needs specific plants like you know everybody knows that the the monarch caterpillar only will eat milkweed and uh, then if you want uh, the painted lady uh, butterfly the caterpillar of that only eats uh, cudweeds which are um, pussy toes and uh, that group of plants so antenaria basically uh, so and, and then, so the, the checker spot, the Baltimore checker spot, which is the state butterfly, uh, only eats chelone. Um, and that is really very rare now. And so why is the, the, uh, checker, spot, uh, the checker spot going to disappear? It's because we've only got five populations basically of the uh, chelone out in, so the turtle head uh, out in, um, in native places. For some reason, unlike the monarch, uh, the monarch butterfly seems to be able to spot a milkweed a mile away and, and lay an egg on, on that. But the, the checker spot needs a whole backyard of it <laughs> to be able to spot it. And for some reason, 
um, they don't they don't find the single plants, so they're they're just starving. They've starved and disappearing. So that's why it's important to plant natives. If you want if you want uh, non-native insects um, and non non-native birds, you plant non-native plants, and you don't you also like those plants without holes in their leaves. Okay. So that's that's why by plant natives, and what and so the difficulty with native is a native is is a plant that's that's grown in the place where you are. So there are native plants in you know, Colorado that are not native here, but they're native in the United States. So the confusing part is that people say they're native because they're native in the United States, but they might not be native here. So an example of that is um, the, the columbine. Uh, there's a, a, a nice, a really pretty blue columbine that we have uh, in the nursery trade. And that is a, that's a, a native species to Colorado. It's not native to here. The, um, the native species is a, a, a red, red columbine. That's Antonaria uh, canadensis. That's a native, anyway. Well, we said hello at the beginning and Maya or Maja, I don't know if you wanted to say hello and introduce yourself. Um, you're welcome to, but you don't have to, but thanks for joining us. Thanks, thanks for putting things, this together. My name is, um, it's pronounced Maya and uh, I think I'm like the rest of you here in Tacoma Park. It's curious about native plants, thank you. So so you, you suggested that you have a back connected area that sounds so it's, it's got tree cover does it have tree cover or is it just a, an area that's it's spotty because we've lost a lot of white oaks here in Tacoma and so okay. it's, it's a lot less shady than it used to be um, right. there's a lot of water runoff from roofs and things okay and you you're wanting uh, fruit trees of some sort so that so you'd be looking at uh, I would put in um, persimmon mm. Okay, male, they come in male and female. Mm -hmm. If you get the female, they'll produce fruit. They'll be small, but they will, because the fruit is actually produced from the, from the, uh, uh, from the flower and not from the ovary. Okay, so, so, the, um, so that you'll always get uh, the fleshy fruits on the female flower, but you won't get seeds. Uh, with the male flower, you, you won't get any fruit at all, but the pollen then will pollinate the female flower and then you'll get seeded fruits and they'll be larger because of the seed inside. And so it's best to have you know, two or three or four of those. So you won't know what sex they are until they're you know, about seven years old. Oh. So you, you just have to take potluck that you're not going to get four, four males. <laughs> and is that the same as the pawpaw trees or fruit? No, no. Pawpaw, paw, that's... Um, I mean, I know it's a different fruit, but you have to have male yeah. and female, right? No, not with, oh. not with pawpaw, no. Pawpaw is a good... I was going to mention that next because that's an understory um, plant. It's, it's, uh, it gets up to around about 15 to 20 feet high spreads widely it doesn't have very strong uh, branches um, but it's so in the shade it grows in the shade and um, purple will uh, yeah so purple is in the shade persimmon is is um, you know, it gets up into the canopy um, but not in the canopy of a, a big oak tree it it gets to probably around about 30 to 40 feet high rather than uh, 60 to 60 to 100 feet high so, but it's it's fine. It's fine in the uh, in the upper part of the canopy of a forest. Yeah. So, I got cuttings so, from a persimmon tree that's here, local, from a neighbor that has the most delicious uh, fruit. So, in the fall, I took some cuttings, and hopefully, it'll uh, work, and I'll be able to grow good. a tree from his cuttings. Hopefully. If you if you can strike them, that's really great. Yeah, they, they, they can be done. So, that's a, it's a really good way to to get. Uh, get the sex right. <laughs> okay. Um, Are there any nut, nut trees that do well in the understory? Nut trees, yeah. Well, so you, you've got uh, various hickories you could put in. Um, the hickories are native here, and so there are there are various hickories you could have, um, and they would be uh, the hickories get up to 
know, 30 to 40 feet high. So they're, they're not small. Um, there are no small nut trees. Uh, they're, they're all, no, they're, they're, we don't, yeah, you know, the carriers are, uh, they're, they're all you know, fairly substantial trees by the time they get to, you know, to be fully grown. And any thoughts on hazelnuts and butternuts, even if they're not native? Um, hey, yeah, so I, yeah, we don't grow them. So uh, yeah, they, they will grow. Um, they certainly grow in your garden for sure. And the, there's, you know, they should be available in uh, in nurseries. Uh, Chesapeake native only grows uh, native plants that are local here. We don't grow anything else. So I'm not an expert in anything that, <laughs> that grows. Well, I am an expert in some of the things from elsewhere, but uh, uh, yeah, those fruit trees, um, I haven't had any experience with growing them, let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, so the understory, um, it, the, there's quite a number of, um, of the vacciniums, so the blueberries, um, the, and um, so yeah, there's deerberry, and um, what else? The, the, there's deerberry. a high bush, high bush, uh, huckleberry, you know, low bush, all of those. They they require um, they require more acid soil. So I would uh, know you either. Um, doctor it up a bit. I, I throw coffee grounds. Uh, if you, if you know, want to know what to do with coffee grounds, put them in the garden and uh, they, they've got a lot of acid in them. So over time, you'll build up the acid through that. How about gooseberry? A gooseberry. We don't have any native gooseberries. Oh. Um, there's, I'm thinking, but there's a species that I'd really love to get into cultivation. Uh, no, no. And that's um, it's a styphelia. It's it's a, it has a chocolatey tasting. They're, they're small seeds, mm -hmm. uh, but they're but it's a really interesting flavour. They're they're really quite small though, uh, and they grow. You find them uh, along the Potomac, so they they will grow in in the forests around here if you plant them. You, know, you mentioned deerberries, which I hadn't heard of. Is that a kind a of deerberry? That's that's um, Vaccinium straminum. And but is that like a blueberry? It's like a blueberry, yeah. And so either deer or humans can eat it. Yeah, deer and humans can eat it. We have a lot of deer. <laughs> they're about the, they're about the same size of a, as a blueberry. The 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 shrubs are um, they're fuller than than the, the huckleberry or the, or the um, <clears throat> blueberry in the, in the forest. In the forest, they, they tend to, no, they're not bred, so they're, they're all kind of lanky, but the, 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 um, the deerberry, which you probably can't get in, in, in uh, any nurseries around, but uh, it's, it would be good. And we've got some, uh, a few plants that grow in the park, uh, in Rosa Real Estate Park. So I think that's uh, that's most of the the fruit trees or fruit shrubs that you would have. Um, Actually, could... Real quick, the other question was around elderberry. Um, so oh yeah, elderberry. That's one. Yeah. Gave me some, but they are native, right? The elderberry's native. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it it's um, it spreads. It's a spreading, um, well, t very tall shrub. It's it's usually as wide as high. It get it does get to be quite. Quite large and easy, easy to trim, easy to mm -hmm. keep in check if you wanted to keep it to about six to ten feet. And then, and I certainly it produces uh, flowers and fruits that you can you can use. And the, oh, then of course I'm now thinking of something else. There's um, aronia. Uh, so there are three species of aronia that are native here. Uh, there's the purple, black, and the red. And these used to be called photinia. Um, Jay, or Jared asked in the chat, is it possible to have a carpet lawn of phlox? I know there's different kinds of phlox, but um, what are your opinions on that? Uh, I, so if you go to a carpet lawn, I don't, yeah. So the, the small one, um, subulatum, could, could be used as a, a carpet, but it's a bit prickly. I, and 
but if you're not walking on it, then it would look a very a bit may be a very nice ground cover, and it, it will take full sun and it, it or part shade. Um, and it's really low and dense, whereas the other flocks is the um, no paniculatum and um, the other one's just escaping me for the moment. But they're they're uh, you know they're tall. Uh, the reason uh we we do grow but the but the the, the taller flocks is, uh are in in cultivation and so they're n virtually nothing you can get uh in any nurseries is going to be native to to this area uh, uh, we know where there are a few sites that uh, we could go and collect seed from and to, to grow more flocks but that's uh um no, just because we want to have <laughs> native um, flocks, whereas the most of the the uh, flocks plants you get in the plant nursery, are, even if they say they're they're base safe or whatever, they they've come from somewhere else usually. Because uh, most of the plants that are in uh, plants in a nursery, are, uh, for a nursery business to operate, if, unless it's a, a volunteer organisation, they can't op they they can't make profit um, because with with native plants they. They have to be produced, mass produced, um, and these are you know, they get vast numbers of seed, air pressured into the soil, grown under lights, um, and then uh, the plugs are, are grown up into quartz and and then sold to the to the nurseries, and so they they get them at a, a reasonable price, and then they they mark them up. But but the the whole process of, of a nursery plant is is quite you no know, commercial nursery is quite different from a from a non profit nursery. Um, well, see, I didn't even realize you were a non profit, although I did notice your website ends in org, and um, I didn't like research a ton of native plant places. But I'm from Baltimore, and the Chesapeake Bay is important to me. So when you named your business Chesapeake Natives, I was like, I'm on board. So that's why I reached out to you all, and Kelly was super helpful in recommending elderberries and pawpaws before. Um, so I'm really just, you know, kudos to you for making that commitment, even though it means, you know, like not a traditional nursery sales model, um, because, you know, the spreading of these both ideas, not a new idea, an old idea, as well as the actual plants themselves is, is an uphill battle. So thank you for doing what you do. Yeah. So the, so the, we, no, because we have vol volunteers are worth money <laughs> the, you know, because uh, you know, the hours you put in or you know, what you're welcome to come down and help. Uh, but you know, the, those hours are, are valuable because they, they make it, make it possible for, for us to get local native plants out. Then we, we actually do sell our plants less than, than um, you can buy a plant in a, nurse, a, a commercial nursery for, for even what they're selling. So um, no, our, our plants are about, well, the $6 for a quart plus tax, $6.36, I guess, and then gallons are nine, um, and then uh, shrubs are 15 and, and plus. So um, most of the nurseries you're looking, you know, probably 20 to 30% more than that. So anyway, um, so we, we've got a very wide range of species. As you, you if you visit the, the website, you probably notice about 160 to 200 species now uh, of natives that are growing around here. Most people don't know, know these plants as natives because uh, the deer usually get in first. The deer go through and uh, eat all the native plants. And so the, the things that are surviving in the forest that you see uh, are largely the plants that are left behind that the deer don't like, like uh, so uh, monadas, um, um, pic, um, yeah, pycnanthemums. Uh, do you have do you have thoughts about uh, the large population of deer and how it impacts our ability to grow these things? Oh yeah, so so we tried to exterminate them back in 1900, and we left a few few hundred around, and so then. Uh, the wise people back then decided, yeah, this species is going to become endangered, so we, we have a moratorium, moratorium on killing them, and then we just let them go crazy. And so now, nowadays, there's 
we only have two ways of, of getting rid of deer and that's um, a few few hunters that are out there hunting and then we have cars that tend to run over about 33,000 of them a month uh, a year and it's amazing number uh, and every every county council goes around and cleans up the deer that have been killed on the roadsides before too many people get out to drive in the morning and I'm always surprised that the insurance company doesn't say we don't want this to happen anymore. But then, of course, they do because they're making money out of uh, car accidents with deers, deer. So, but anyway, so so the the number of deer that should be on the landscape would be around about four um, four adults per um, per square mile, which is a big area. Okay. And but now we have around about 200. And so the pressure on our land, uh, our forest is really high. Uh, and so when, you, when you're walking through the understory of a forest, you, you're not actually seeing very much of what was native here. Um, and only in a few pockets you'll find where the deer can't get to, then, then you'll have some of the natives still existing. Are there native plants that they won't eat? Yeah, well, yeah. so the thing about a deer is if it's really hungry, it's going to try everything. Um, but there are some species that they you know once biting, they, they don't. And so, so the mints that I meant to you, some, about half of the species of mints that, that are local um, uh, have a deer, a deer resistant. Let's put, no, the, the deer don't like the taste of, of mints. So pycnanthemums uh, and... Uh, Monadas, um, salvia, and there. What else? The scotodaria, scotodaria. So there, there are a few things that they they won't eat. Um, and uh, the milkweeds they will usually bite and and not eat them after they've um, tasted them. Uh, so the things that you see in the forest, uh, the blueberries uh, are probably a little bit prickly for them or something. They they don't tend to, to really damage the blueberries so much. Uh, I suspect that they don't like um, the, uh, it comes up in, I'm, I'm thinking of, well, so so the, um, I'm looking out the window just here and my, uh, the bluebells, um, Mertensia, uh, they are either growing so quickly that the deer can't eat them or else they they have something in them that the don't, deer don't like. Um, the poda, podophyllum, the um, and so the, the deer don't seem to, to, to go for that. So there are a number of things that the, the deer don't don't eat um, as a preference. But if they're really hungry, I think they're going to chew on virtually everything. Have you got any recommendations for deer repellent? Um, a dog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or a, a cat <laughs> it's just topped up on my knee <laughs> um, then uh, no, I'm so, sure. so there, there are so people hang soap uh, that tends to, to keep them away a bit um, so there are a few things that and there are, there are certainly some deer sprays that are not very nasty, not, not, not very nice smelling. So the people use those. But deer are forest edge species usually. They're, so and we've created so many forest edges by you know, just the way we live. Um, we've made small pockets of trees, and then the deer are around them. So um, the, the deer usually don't go deep into the forest ordinarily. So um, what else? Yeah. So I. I the deer are just a, a problem wherever they are. The, the best thing for a deer is lead poisoning, probably. Chris, there's a question in the chat. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm not looking. I'm looking, not looking at the chat. I'm just. Yeah, that's okay. just uh, Jared's interested Thanks. in something that is herbal or fragrant when you walk on it. Like maybe there's a, a native mint that could be a carpet lawn, or many any other yeah. herb. Yeah. So um, I would. So, so the monad the pycnanthemums are, are scented. There's there's a couple of monadas that we have uh, that at this time of the year um, they form a carpet, but then then as the spring comes along, they they'll shoot up into shoots. So basically, they almost overwinter as a as a 
a low carpet and you can certainly tread on those and they, they smells very fragrant. Um, and so the, the Menada is um, another name for it is bergamot. So the oil of bergamot it is in it. So that's the sort of smell that you're getting. Um, so what else? Not too many, there's not too many, um, yeah, perennials that are scented, but then of course you've got some, uh, some shrubs like uh, spice bush, uh, which are really nice. You can, they, they you know, rub up against those and the, the and then of course, uh, sassafras. Um, the, the, I see dots, uh, Maya's writing lots of notes. <laughs> I, I won't be able to remember answer. any of okay. this. I need to jot it down. Um, okay, so it's, do you want me to just share? I, I have a, a presentation that I can whip through just really quickly for I, you. I mean, I'd be interested in it. I think, you know, folks can jump off if they need to and yeah. this is being recorded so you can always come back and check it out later. So if you need to go, TJ already did, but, you know, bye. But, Thanks for coming. Okay, but you can keep, uh, keep asking me questions if you like. Um, <laughs> and as, as we're going through, let me just. Oh, oh. my cat has decided he, she wants to be right up the top here. I should have started this from the beginning, shouldn't I? So, already started. Oh, good. Here, here we have some spelling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing it all down phonetically and then have to translate into Latin. Okay. All right, so this is a presentation I, I can't even remember where I gave it now, but um, it, because it's, it's right seasonal. So this is uh, um, bluebells, uh, Virginia bluebell, and uh, another species of, uh, this is um, Pacara aurea. Uh, both grow together, no, they're really good ground, both of them are really good ground. Uh, Pacara is really good because it's, it's uh, green for, for a very much longer period of time. Um, uh, just in case you're interested in oaks, oaks are just about to release their pollen in the next week or so, two weeks. Um, these are the catkins of, of, of oaks and uh, the names are there. These are the, uh, most people don't even know that the oaks have female flowers and these are where the, ac the acorns come from these. These are really small and um, so the, the uh, red oaks produce their fruits every second year, even though they flower every year, but you've got um, a two year cycle before you get the uh, acorns on. Um, and the, the, so on the left of the, the, uh, the, uh, the top one is, is a white oak and the rest of them are red oaks. Uh, you're all familiar with this, if you see that's coming to flower. Uh, lots of them are out. Um, this is a, a very quick growing um, tree, understory tree, and it's, uh, it's not very good for just everything. <laughs> uh, it has wonderful leaves. Uh, leaf cutter um, bees use this in the um, middle of the year. And, uh, you'll see holes, no, gaps in the, the leaves because the, the leaf covers come through. Um, Quick question yeah. about the red buds. We got uh, the heart-shaped leaf red bud. Mm -hmm. And is that, I mean, it's a different kind. And it, we got them at Costco. <laughs> but yeah. uh, I wonder if they're, if that's, if we made a boo-boo. Well, it's not native here. Um, so if you want your garden to be just native, but most most people have some things in from somewhere else, and we you know. And in terms of, uh, it's a it's an American native. I'm not entirely sure where it's where its boundary is. Um, this is uh, Canadensis, and it's uh, widespread on the east. Um, yeah. And uh, I mentioned uh, Linda before, this is uh, spice bush. It comes in male and female. You can check out your botany if you've got these in your backyard. Um, the male flowers have stamens and anthers. So males have all the anthers, remember that. Um, and the females don't have anthers at all. Uh, they might have really reduced pieces of that, uh, 
with this daemon, but they're not fertile. And so you have male, uh, male trees that will not produce fruits and females that do. Um, this is uh, uh, wild ginger. It's, it's uh, a really good ground cover. Uh, it doesn't have any scent and the flowers are small. Uh, they're about half an inch uh, in, in there underneath the leaves and they'll come on in about May. I mentioned pussy toes before in passing. This is uh, one of uh, about five species that we have. Um, and the, uh, the caterpillar you can see on, on this is the caterpillar of the painted lady. Uh, it's really interesting because what, what you find with this is uh, when you've got caterpillars, they're, they're laid and they, they actually um, create a nest by, by curling the leaves over and then they eat the insides of the leaves out and then uh, the, the leaves look white. And then when the caterpillar is too big, you just see them roaming over the tops of the, the plants before they go off and, and um, pupate. Uh, more antenarias. This is uh, this is a male. So these come in males and females, um, and uh, the the females usually have one male flower in the middle, and that seems to be enough to uh, uh, pollinate all the, the flowers that are around. The males um, just reproduce by you know, spreading more than anything else. I think. <laughs> Um, Packer aurea, I mentioned to you before, really great count, ground cover. Uh, and so this is really good for, for, you know, for, for your gardens in full shade. And, and it will grow in the sun too, but um, semi I would always just recommend semi shade to full shade for this. Um, chickweed, this is the native chickweed. We have some non native uh, chickweeds around. This is of lutinum, he was confused with the uh, uh, NC, which is the non native one. Um, it, it has larger flowers. Uh, the flowers are around about um, uh, just under half an inch across, whereas the, the, the non native one is, is less, than, less than a quarter inch across. Um, Silene, uh, this, is, this is a really hardy plant once you get it going. Um, the catch flies, they're not very common. I've, I see them growing uh, around um, Little Bennett Park. So you can see, you'll see that out there if you're um, looking around. Um, anemones grow in the shade in the forest. They'll be coming up shortly. These, these go through most of these plants go, go through and flower and fruit rapidly. And uh, so then the seeds sit in the soil. They, they get, usually most of these seeds have uh, what's called an eliasome, a little tiny piece of flesh, it's a placenta. And the ants like the placenta and they carry the, the seeds into the ground. So you don't see the, uh, the seeds for very long. They, they basically disappear within a day as soon as the, the, the flowers are out, uh, or the, the, these, the pods are out and, and break open. I uh, mentioned uh, Aquilichia before, uh, red columbine, this is a native one. Um, Houstonia, which is really small, it's a really nice little ground cover. And uh, it's, it, these, the plants, the stalks get up to around about maybe four inches above the ground. At, uh, but it's uh, a, a nice, pretty little flower, column bullets. Um, stone crop. And this is the, the only of one of the sedums that, that is native. All the, the other uh, sedums that are around are, are yellow flowered. And so this is the native one. It grows in full shade. And it's a little bit sensitive. It doesn't like to be walked on. Um, so uh, it breaks up, breaks up really easily. And and it needs to be kept uh, a little bit uh, moist. It, do, it doesn't like to be dried out entirely. Uh, the violets, lots of violets uh, in this area. A primrose, this is a primrose one. The, the, the one we see a lot of is the Confederate uh, violet. The, it comes in both blue and white. 
and um, and so it's it's out of flower in my garden right now. It's it's just all over. Um, lots of, but there are there is a, a dozen or so more, probably more than a dozen violets. Um, and there's there's a yellow one. Maybe I've got the oh, there's the yellow one. Smooth yellow violet. This is a flower in the Potomac uh, around Bear Island right now, and you'll be able to see it there. Um, what, what I looked at, oh, it's pretty fair in place. Okay, so the, this is a, a species that you won't have in the garden. This is an annual, um, but it's I I do recommend you, you know if you if you get hold of annual plants and and you'll that these will disappear and the seed will still be around for next year and they'll come up again. So well, uh, and we we don't usually sell annuals because you no. Know, People say that well, the plants disappeared. <laughs> yeah, they will. Um, skunk cabbage. Most people don't have a weird enough place for that. Um, the harbinger of spring. This is out in flower right now uh, around the Potomac, uh, Bear Island, and and uh, across a, a turkey run on the other side. Um, and native. We don't have this in cultivation, but uh, it's. Um, it's a really nice um, plant to, to get. I, I don't think anybody has this in, in their um, repertory for, for sale. I've um, always been looking for it, but we never seem to get the seed for it. As I say, most of these, these plants, uh, um, they, they flower and fruit really quickly and you have to be sitting watching over them to, to actually get the seed from them to, before, before they've gone underground. Um, and most of the spring ephemerals uh, take a long time to, to grow. So you know, they're, they're not a plant that the nursery really wants to be growing because usually in the first year, the, there's only one, one leaf that will come up. Uh, and then the next year, maybe two or three, and then the next year you might get a flower. So, so it's gonna take a, a number of years of really nursing a plant along before um, before it gets to a, a, even a size that you can put on the market, but uh, and there's a lot of it's precarious to actually carry it that long, and there's a lot of effort in doing it. Um, so, uh, what would you recommend? You know, if you're going to uh, cite some of these, what what do you really need to pay attention to to be sure that you've you're successful? Because you know, it's you invest in a plant, you put it in, and you find out that the conditions aren't right and you lose it <clears throat> so um well with with these plants um generally the these are all in the forest they're so but they they grow in the sun full sun so when the leaves are before the leaves are fully out on the trees um these will be this is no, that, so they grow in the sun but but uh, before the, the leaves on the trees. Uh, how would you know whether they will continue to grow? Most of these plants have really strong root systems and they should be, you know, the, the perennials will, will come up year after year after you've got them in, in the ground. So blood roots and um, Jeffersonia um, and uh, what, uh, there's, a, there's another one I have, um, is uh, the uh, primula, primula, the the, the uh, shooting star? It's a brilliant plant. Uh, it's not quite. It if you're in Tacoma, you're just in enough Piedmont for it to be considered native. Uh, it's not native to the coastal plain, so it gets into um, some of the areas around the Piedmont. So it may have been. In Tacoma Park before we built the city over the top of it. Um, certainly Dutch, uh, Dutchman breaches. This is um, no. One of the things about about most of these plants, they grow in uh, really rich loamy soil, and um, one of the things about our soil is uh, we've largely everybody comes to me and says all I've got is, is clay well what the reason you have clay is the clay is what sits underneath the loam that was sitting on top of it um, we've lost essentially through erosion we've lost the, um, the, the 
the A horizon, which has all the, um, the essentially the, the A horizon, the soil, which has all the um, carbon that's providing nutrition for the, for the plants that are growing on the surface. The mushroom species, this one grows really very easily once you've got it going uh, in, in that loamy soil. That name is hilarious. Which one? Dutchman species? I assume that's because of the flowers? Yeah, yeah, that's right. The, the other one is called um, squall, squall corn. What, what's, there's, a, there's another one. That, there's, there are two, two species that we have around. <laughs> I don't have it here, but, um, but there's another one that has, uh, the, the flowers are not quite as wide. <laughs> the reaches are not so, so <laughs> kind of wide as the, they are in this one. Um, so the two dicentras. Um, this is a really nice one, and, and certainly around Tacoma Park and um, um, around what's the, the little stream that runs up near um, uh, on the other side of the Beltway. I've uh, just lost the name of it. Of course, I always start doing this. I start thinking of a person that's name. I mean, you're thinking uh, Carson. So. Carson um, Oh, Rachel, so, Rachel, Rachel Carstens, near Rachel Carstens property. This is this is um, up up in the uh, around down the well, down down the the riverside there and through the forest. This this is a really really lovely little plant, and we do have this in the nursery. I saw maybe fifty or sixty plants of this uh, are available for sale right now. And it's in flower, just like this uh, early sassafras. Sassafras uh, doesn't have a, a center, so it's not related to sassafras. Um, uh, this again, this is another one. So this um, trout lily is is one that again, the, the first year will only put up one leaf and no flowers. The second year maybe put out two leaves and no flowers. And until it really gets going, you you won't have uh, very much shine for it. And we don't we don't have this in in the nursery, but it's, uh, no, as I say, if you can catch, now if you're walking around and you can catch the seed, um, the, uh, it, will, it will grow for you. Um, so where I have the Mertensia in the garden, the, 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 uh, the bluebell, it's, um, it, I, I, I got some stem, oh, well, actually uh, rhizome, uh, which is an underground stem. Um, and, and grew the plants from that. And now the seed of dropping and I've got young seedlings coming up and it's one or two leaves uh, after you know, two or three years. So the, these are all growing up. And this is under a maple tree, which is really hard. Uh, I, I, I find it really difficult to think that uh, these plants are actually growing in maple, which is, a, um, the roots are really dense. So you, you can get, uh, you know, the spring ephemerals growing up through a really dense root mat. Um, Tiarella, really nice. This is a you know, makes a really good ground cover. Uh, we have this. Uh, this is heart, heart leaf fan flower, and uh, so we have we have this uh, in the nursery usually. Um, Jeffersonia, twin leaf. Uh, this is where I was mentioning this, this, this seed pod would break open like this and within, you know, this would be one day and the next day all the seed are gone. Every seed will be, will, no, there won't be a single seed left and you wonder how did they get away and it's because the ants come and, and, and uh, carry them off. Um, Uvularia. Essentially, all these all these have that same strategy of, of uh, producing seeds. They disappear, and uh, in the, the plants and the, the the flowers are only there for for a week or two weeks, and then then the the, the entire plants disappeared. Trillium. Uh, there are about six or seven native species of trillium in this area. Sanguinaria, you probably have that in the forest just behind you. And I know in Forest Glen, they're in the forest. Um, 
down behind uh, near the school. There's a creek that runs in the back there for a slant. Send them in there. Martensia, I've mentioned to you several times. Um, okay, Spring Beauty is these have little potatoes, uh, and there's a penny there um, alongside. Of, and each th these plants are very old. The, the, so the the across on the right hand side, those um, underground tubers are probably around about ten to fifteen years old. And so th this again grows up just those one or two leaves for the first year and not flowering, and then after that you you'll get the the tuber is is really it's the size of a a, a rice grain to start with, and then they keep on growing up and producing more leaves on it year by year. This is a very hardy one. As soon as you get it in and, and growing it, it will just keep on coming back. Trout lily, uh, Jack, Jack in the pulpit rather, um, uh, needs wet soil, um, grows very easily. The, from from seed, you can walk, just walk along, and if you've got a wet place, you can and um, you can move the flowers or the, the fruits really quite easily from that. Um, Podophyllum, you know the story about podophyllum. Podophyllum um, generally grows in colonies, and um, you wonder how the the fruits get around to to, to get to a new place. The, these are eaten by turtles. And the turtles burrow under the ground and um, defecate the the seeds out under the ground, about eight inches under the ground, and then these plants will germinate. They don't germinate on the surface at all. So, um, so this is a really interesting story of a close relationship of of a species of plant with with animal. Um, when the animal disappears, then largely the species will disappear once the colony is gone. Uh, ginseng, there used to be a, this area, the Tacoma Park used to have ginseng. We now only have ginseng out in about four places. Uh, there's a little bit of Catuctan, there's some of um, uh, Greenbrier, and then out into um, the, the far west of Maryland. Uh, it used to be in 17 counties and it was harvested heavily back in the 1860s. Now it's largely disappeared. And the same way with golden seal, that's now only known from one place out in, in Garrett County. Um, but it was widespread. And uh, this one should uh, is, is really easy to grow. It grows from a spaghetti-like um, rhizome, and uh, whereas the ginseng is, is a carrot, and the ginseng um, basically, once you've take the, taken the plant out, it's gone. Whereas this one should be, should have been easy to grow, but we've largely lost that. And the golden seal and the ginseng, um, was that over harvested because of the, the herbal or nutritional value, or did we just bulldoze over it? No, no, yeah, it was harvested. It was really valuable. It was, it was more valuable than, than gold. Um, ginseng? Yeah, ginseng and also golden seal. So okay. both of them are, are herbal. Um, we saw, so you probably heard that Daniel Boone, um, who became a congressman, and uh, so he funded his uh, run for Congress on on the money that he raised from from um, harvesting ginseng. And so there's, about, I can't remember the the, the the amount. Maybe it was a a uh, thousand pounds of, of ginseng on a barge that was coming down the river and it turned over. And so they lost the load. Uh, it was worth uh, $50,000 or something. And so they went out and just collected it all over again. And just, um, so anyway, that's a story. We, we've um, now one has to have a license to, to even collect it. Most, most people that have any ginseng on their property will not tell you that they have it because um, it's so rare and um, it's so valuable. So, um, and it's also eaten by deer. So, um, 
And the, the places I've seen, I did a survey back in 2011 um, across Maryland looking for, for ginseng and also for golden seal. And so we went back to all the old sites that, that it was known and we spent a lot of time looking for it. And the only places we were really finding it were where the, uh, where the spice bush was so dense that the deer couldn't get under it to get to the ginseng. And, and so, because the, the spice, but the, the, the deer don't eat the spice bush, and so it's protected by, um, no, the, the ginseng is protected by the, 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 the plants over the top of it. And also, you know, if you've got fallen down branches and things like that with it, and the deer can't get to it, then we're finding plants there. Okay. Um, this am I going back? Great. I love the spring ephemeral theme. You know, the cherry blossoms are ephemeral beauty that the Japanese cherish in their culture and DC we have that ephemeral beauty with this with the cherry blossoms. But, you know, I think our focus should be on native plants and the ephemeral beauty of, you know, the seeds that disappear within the day and the caterpillar yeah. that turn into the butterflies. So this is super inspiring. Anyway, so this is just you know, what, you know, what you f would see out now if you're going walking, basically, if you as I mentioned, uh, Bear Island, uh, just on the other side of the Beltway, is a really good place to, to have a wander through there. And, and you see most, most of the species. Sorry? This is your facility? This is this is in Upper Marlborough, yes. This is a facility. So this is an old greenhouse. Uh, it was built in 1935 as a Luton greenhouse. So, um, it was $50,000 when, when it was built in the middle of the recession. So you can just imagine <laughs> there would have been half a million dollars equivalent today to build this greenhouse. Um, and it doesn't have any glass in it now. The glass was all knocked out in probably the 1970s. And so we used this, uh, so our plants are, are all hardened before they, uh, so we, we basically can guarantee that the plants will grow. So you know, normally in, in, a, in a nursery where the, the plants are, are protected by glass, the, uh, the, they get shocked when they get outside. And so we don't have that problem because we don't have glass to protect them. So um, anyway, this is the, this is the nursery. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, does anyone else have other questions? It's after seven, so I want to oh, that's okay. our time together. But Ch Chris, you've been so helpful. Does anyone else have questions you want to get Chris's viewpoint on right now? It's like the the terrible question to ask at the end of the meeting when everyone wants to leave. No. <laughs> so did somebody did somebody put something in the chat that they wanted me to answer? Uh, and it's brilliant. Yes, they they certainly are. Uh, so uh, we have a native lupin, uh, so the sundial lupin, and and that grows. In, it's unusual because those are widespread species across the whole whole of uh, North America. Uh, in in our area, it grows and grows in sand, and so the seed on on the lupin also disappears because as soon as they're, they're released, the the ants carry them underground into the sand. They actually have the you know, the the soft sand is is a good nest for them, and so they the, the seeds disappear straight away. Yeah, it flowers. I have yeah. to say, if anyone hasn't um, read The Overstory by Richard Powers, it was a really incredible book, novel for me to read about learning about trees. Um, have any of you read The Overstory? No, it's it's by Richard Powers. It's, um, oh, uh, yes, great. Philip has. Um, I listened to it on Audible, and then I bought the book because I wanted to go back and actually see the names of the trees. Um, but really inspiring, just like this chat today. And thank you so much. Chris. Okay. Well, just before you go, this arrived in, in the mail today. I'm going to turn the, my video off so that I'll turn the um, background off so you can actually see it. Oh, no, I didn't. What happened? There we go, none. So this is a book that's just come out um, just uh, about a week or so ago. Who's the author? The author is, is Doug Tallamy. Okay. Of, um, um, Nature's Best Hope, which is his second book, and then the previous one was Bringing Nature Home. Um, so, anyway, uh, a nice. I'll post 
this on YouTube and um, make it public. So if you want anybody to, you know, be pointed towards it to hear your brilliance so that we don't all have to get you six people at a time, it'll take forever for you to educate folks about native plants that way. But this was incredible. And you've got a great group of people here who will go spread the gospel of native plants to others. We're all sneezers. We sneeze this information on other people. <laughs> well, just wear your mask. And uh, so <laughs> we, we, we're selling, no, we, uh, Right now, the way way we're through through this COVID time is uh, we sell online, and so we quickly transferred to selling online last year because previously we we had open houses uh, once a month, and then uh, the point, uh, people bought by appointment. Now everything is online until uh, my team down at the greenhouse get comfortable with with having visitors come out which one of the things we really miss is is talking to people about about native plants because you know, there there are no really good books uh, written and, and having having experience and people in the greenhouse usually have experience about you know, growing the natives and so we we actually miss chatting like that yeah cool uh, i don't know if margaret wants to fill in here but um Pollinator Week is June 9, uh, 21st through 27th. We are launching something here in Tacoma Park on Sunday the 20th, and then there'll be other events with kids and tours of, of yards, um, you know, neighborhood walks, visiting yards where people have emphasized native species, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, so keep your eye out for that. Um, I'll put my email in the chat and anybody that wants to be notified, I'll. I'll try to follow up with you. Great. I think to add on to that, Philip, um, there's the city is sponsoring. We're, we're helping them organize it, but there's going to be a um, an event on June 22nd at seven. It's going to be virtual, <clears throat> and um, it hasn't been advertised yet. But there'll be a video by Doug Tallamy and based on Nature's Best Hope, and there will be um, a panel of experts. So uh, it'll be, I'm pretty sure it's going to be pretty informative, you know, and the goal is to get the word out there. So look for that. We'll be sending a press release out, but not, not probably for another month or so. Right. So if you, you know, Doug is, is winding down giving his presentation on, uh, on Nature's Best Hope. So he's, and now and he's starting to give presentations on. His right. Uh, so. So if you want to hear him in person, then then uh, rather than recorded, uh, get it get in quickly. Find out where he's talking. <laughs> so. Well, we're we're trying to. There's a group of people that are trying to get um, the city to sponsor him to come to Tacoma Park. But of course, since it's COVID, it'll all be virtual. But yeah, um, it, and I'm not it, sure when that would happen. I don't know what Dr. Tallamy's schedule is like, but that he's a little bit expensive and. Um, Hopefully, we'll figure something out along this I, I, line. I was, so. I was really quite surprised when it was only $500. <laughs> <So>. Oh. <laughs> well, this one was, he, this was 1000 so. Oh, was it? Okay. Right. Yeah. But um, I don't know. There's, a, there's options, so. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to have dinner now, so I'm going <laughs> to sign off. and uh, Thank, thank you, you for much. joining us. It's a nice half hour.